Take out your smartphones, your cell phones, whatever portable device you have on your person, raise it high. How many of you, first thing this morning, before you even got out of bed, checked this thing for email, for Facebook posts, for text messages? Raise them high, raise them high. Isn't that wild? How many of you have your phone on the nightstand when you go to sleep at night, on the nightstand? Almost the same number of hands. How many of you actually sleep with the phone in the same bed? Yeah. When did our behavior suddenly change so dramatically? When did you start sleeping with your personal mobile device? When did you start taking it to the restroom with you, right? Do you remember the day, the month, the week, the year? Suddenly one morning you woke up and your behavior had changed. Simultaneously, so the invisible behaviors that we have are being somehow revealed, but at the same time, what else is being revealed to us? The behavior of the machine. So what I want to try to do with you today is to help you understand how in your businesses, as well as in your lives, how you can better understand how to leverage this incredible asset called behavior. Our behaviors and the behaviors of these machines. And I will bring you to places that are very uncomfortable. I will talk about machines in ways that you don't want to talk about them. But what I hope to do is to give you a sense for why it's important for us to embrace this new normal, how to enter this future with optimism rather with the gloom and the doom and the pessimism that so often we surround ourselves with. And there's, need, you know, there's, there's fear, there's reason for fear. I get that, I understand it, I value my privacy as well. We should have legislation around privacy, all of that I get. But we're building these digital selves that will have incredible value. And yes, we're giving away so much of who we are in doing that. But what we don't see yet, we see the fear, right? We see the terror. We see the reasons not to do it. We see the downside, but we don't yet see the upside. So your digital self is the single most valuable asset that humanity has created. There's one problem with your digital self. You don't own it. I don't own my digital self. It's owned by myriad other players, social media players, technology players. Somewhere in all this, I need to have an interest in that digital self. Be honest with me. How many of you are stuck in the past? You wake up in the morning and you say, damn it, I am stuck in the past again. How many of you? No one, right? Mm. But what if I were to tell you that we all behave as though we were stuck in the past? Hold that thought. Hold that thought for a minute. I want you to look at these ads. Think to yourself, you what, year, what year did these uh, uh, series of, of ads called the You Will Campaign by AT&T, what year were these broadcast, did these air? When do you think it was? Pressing it, right? Because you saw GPS right there. This AT&T knew exactly, when these things aired, they knew exactly what 2018 would look like. I mean, they hit the nail square on the head. Tablet computing. They called it sending a fax from the beach. Don't you love that? Right? Using the language of the past to describe the future. Uh, you're going to see WebEx here in a minute. What year was it? What year did AT&T air these ads? 88, someone said. 83, someone said. Yeah, believe it or not, it was 1993. 1993. They knew exactly what today would look like. Netflix. Prescient? So here's the question I have for you. Anyone from AT&T in the room? Good, because they don't like this question when it gets asked. How the hell could you predict the future so well and not capitalize on it? How does that happen? They, they understood the technology perfectly. They got it. There's an answer, by the way, because the answer AT&T will give you, if you talk to folks that were around at that point in time, that had the McKinsey's come in and help them understand what the future would look like. Their answer is, we knew it would be there, we just didn't think it would be this big. What makes that technology big isn't the technology. It's the behavior that we adapt and we form around that technology. That's what makes it big. For every major technology slash behavioral shift, there is a crisis of complexity. There is a trigger that happens right in the midst of that crisis, and you can't predict the trigger. It just happens. It's, all, it's almost a divine intervention of, of some sort. Then after the trigger, you have adoption. Sometimes the adoption is legislated. Sometimes it happens because it, it's a survival mechanism that we need in order to be able to continue to make progress as an enterprise, as individuals, as societies. There's a critical mass that you achieve and a new value axis. And this new value axis is critically important because the old value axis no longer applies. You throw that one out. So what does this look like? So let's take that AT&T example, right? So over time, technology begins to progress. So AT&T knows that there's a progression that will lead to telecommunications and to digitization, and all the things that GPS, all the things that you saw up there. They understand that. They get the technology piece of it. 
The time between the introduction of that technology usually or its conception and the point of crisis and the trigger is usually somewhere in the 40 to 60 year range. Any idea why? And you can go back for the last 300 years and this number still applies. And if, in, in the book I use multiple examples that we don't have time for here, but it, I'm, I'm fascinated by the time period. You want to guess why it's 40 to 60 years? Generational. Until a lot of us die off, the stuff doesn't take hold. Because we, we're like blockers, we're like you know, a, 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 you know, a defensive line on a football team. We don't want to let that new behavior come through. Because the behavior is what? It's aberrant. Right? My kids are on the device 23 hours a day. That's aberrant behavior. They're being antisocial. Now forget the fact that they're actually on that device with 100,000 other kids at the same time, gaming, right? They're being antisocial, we say. Right? We're like the defensive line. We don't want to let that new behavior through because it's not the behavior we're accustomed to. And this is about behavior and how well we understand it and how well we can interpret it into technology. Speaking of which, one of my favorite examples of behavioral technology that was tremendously in in invasive, intrusive, uh, that revealed our privacy in ways that we never thought it would be revealed or wanted to be revealed. Anyone know who this guy is? Roger Easton. Anyone know what Roger did? He, he, he patented a device which every single person in this room has today, I can guarantee you. What did Roger Easton patent? 74 was it? Yeah, 1974. GPS. Roger began working on GPS in 1943. Hold that thought. Something happened 40 years after the day Roger began working on GPS that created the crisis and the trigger that ultimately led to the reason you and I have GPS today. Anybody? 1983, once again. Korean Airlines 007 shot down because he went into Soviet, supposedly into Soviet airspace by a Soviet fighter, killing all passengers on board. One of the people on board was a U.S. congressman, made big headlines. What did Reagan do as a result of 007 going down? He said, you know what? GPS is now available to private industry. It's no longer just available to the military. So the irony of that incident, I mean, the, the tragedy is immense here. A passenger plane does not have access to GPS and therefore strays into Soviet airspace, which will only, only be defined through GPS, which is only available to military. That is a crisis of complexity. Our tools are not keeping up with us. Our technology has exceeded our ability to adapt to it behaviorally. So what do we do? We change the behavior, which is why you all have GPS today. What is she doing? What is she doing? She's swiping, because to her, a magazine is a defective iPad, right? It should be intelligent. It should behave a certain way. You're not stuck in the past, are you? But you know people who are. You know people who aren't going to adopt <laughs> quite as readily as you and I might. Right? Have you ever told your kids where the term cut and paste really comes from? Right? Like, Whoa, really? You used to actually cut and paste? How cool is that? So we're seeing all these inflection points that are saying to us, you know what, the, the current models, they just don't work. The way we, we look at consumers, the way we, we think of, of, of the way we run our businesses and scale our businesses and our enterprises, the way we think of factories, the way we think of healthcare, education, none of these models really work. They worked really well. I'm not dismissing them. They are the models that got us to where we are today. They were marvelous, brilliant, but they won't keep working going forward. So the savior is, because this is what we all talk about, we have to have a savior. Artificial intelligence. Yeah, I, I don't like the term at all. I, I don't know how you feel about it. Um, I'll give you an alternative in just a few minutes, but something has to give. And at least AI causes us to think in terms that are uncomfortable, and when you're uncomfortable, you're more likely to come up with answers. Because that's when you learn, right? That's when you get educated, when you're really uncomfortable. So the societal discomfort we have today, I actually think is a very good thing. It is the educator that will, as a society, teach us what that next era should look like and what we need to do. But if you think about from 1800, which is what the horizontal axis shows here, to 2100, if you think about things like uh, population growth, which we just to talk about, and then plot GDP, global GDP, uh, and U.S. GDP, you see enormous increases. Things are actually getting better. And you've probably seen some of this. You've read about some of this. It's not all gloom and doom. Things are getting better. 
My point is not that, th that they aren't getting better and they won't continue to get incrementally better, but we need more than incremental improvement right now. Mark did that marvelous job of talking about the importance of thinking exponentially. So how do you do that, though? And I don't want to go through the math. How do you actually do that? How do you develop, and could we be at the precipice of developing a, a global population where poverty is pretty much eradicated? Right, where we have global health care, where we have universal services for all people on the planet. Because we have seven plus billion devices that we can use to talk to each other, but only about two and a half to three billion of us really have access to those devices on a regular basis. Right? So what, what does that world look like and how does AI create that world? If I could tell you I would be a brilliant person, I can't, so I'll rely on other brilliant people to tell you. And one of these people was Karl Popper, one of the great philosophers of the last century, of the 20th century. And what Carl said is, look, he said every problem is either a clock problem or a cloud problem. Clock problems are finite and solvable. Cloud problems never will be. I would submit to you that we are just now at that, that line of demarcation between the clock problems and the cloud problems. And your job, the, the most challenging aspect of your job, is to make that transition and to bring your organization with you. Because we won't stop solving clock problems. They will still continue to be there but more and more of the problems you face will be cloud problems. So you know, what, is, what does this mean? So the biggest clock problem, sort of the, the end of the era of clock problems really was uh, the moonshot, right? G getting a human being to the moon and back again was the biggest clock problem that we ever solved. And, and you know, we, 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 we forget how amazing that was, right? I mean, the, so, so we're, here's what's really cool, some numbers for you. So both Apollo and the moon actually moved through space at the same uh, relative velocity. So it's about 34 to 3,600 kilometers per hour. So, and that's, that's about four times as fast as a 38 caliber bullet. So imagine, right, two objects moving four times as fast as a 38 caliber bullet and, and rendezvousing a quarter of a million miles in outer space, right? That was the extent of that problem. And it was done, holy shit, if they had had one of these, they would have been, I mean, they had slide rules, right? Uh, can you imagine? This thing has hundreds of millions of times more memory um, and hundreds of thousands of times more processing power. So we did that with rudimentary, rudimentary finite tools. It was the biggest clock problem that we ever solved. Clock problems are finite. Tic-tac-toe is a clock problem. It has exactly 250,000 total possible legal moves. End of story, right? It's solvable, ideal clock problem. Uh, checkers and chess, also more complex, but they're brute force problems. So you hear from Gary Kasparov tomorrow, wonderful uh, story. Uh, I'd encourage you all to be here for that tomorrow, first thing tomorrow morning. Uh, what Gary will tell you is that this wasn't AI. What beat him wasn't AI, it was brute force. So chess may be mathematically on the fringes of solvability, but it is solvable. It has a certain number of moves. Maybe it's 10 to the 20th, 10 to the 40th, 10 to the 120th, depending on who you talk to. Uh, and how they constitute legal versus illegal moves, but it's finite. But then you get to games like Go, which aren't solvable. These are intuitive games. The number of moves in Go, if you include funky moves that may or may not be uh, legal, uh, on a 19 by 19 board is, is 10 to the 800th. I'll show you how big that number is in just a minute. Okay? But you can't solve Go, and yet Google has, through DeepMind, created AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero, both of which have solved the problem. AlphaGo Zero has actually solved it without any training. No human had to train AlphaGo Zero how to solve the problem. AlphaGo had to be seeded with certain rules by which you would you know, play the game against itself to learn how to play it. AlphaGo Zero did not. So we are on the fringes of creating AI that truly can teach itself, given the data set large enough, can teach itself. So how big? is the magnitude of the problem. So w w on a log scale, because you can't draw this linearly, and I'll show you why. This is the number of moves to the power of 10 for each of these games. And I've thrown checkers in here as well. So 10 to the 800th, how large is it? If I were to draw this not on a log scale, but on a linear scale, the size of that bar for Go would exceed the visible bounds of the universe. That's how, that's how big the bar alone would be, trying to describe that in a linear, in a linear way. So the immensity of these problems, this is the crisis of complexity I was talking about. We are in the midst of it. The, pro the cloud problems we are trying to solve no longer can be solved with clock tools and clock approaches and clock methodologies and clock education. They can't. We need AI, and this will upset some of you, as a new species with which we can co 
inhabitate the future. So, we all know that we've gone through these eras. We all know that we've been able to do more individually over time because of these new tools that we have. So, you know, physical labor, muscle goes down and brain power takes over and we can do more as the individual. The impact of the individual goes up, but it's plateauing. So again, I would submit to you, and I'll show you a, a, a wonderful illustration of this in just a minute. I would submit to you that our abilities and in, in as an individual to solve the problem is not to diminish. And we will feel that frustration. We will feel that pain. And it will terrorize us because as we are less able to deal with the problem, we will feel that we are inept to take on the future. And that is so wrong. That is so wrong. Because what humanity does really well when it can't handle the future with the tools it has is it builds new tools. Okay, just hold that thought for a second. So what does this look like as we, as we move beyond this? And, and my response is it's not about the individual. That's where we get it wrong. Right? It's not about using a 1,800, 98% of the population of the world was involved in agriculture in 1,800, but they were feeding a billion people. Today we have, what, like 2% of, of the labor force in the U.S. involved in agriculture, but we're feeding you know, close to 8 billion people? How does that happen? Because you're not using a plow horse and a plow to plow the fields. Right, you build new tools. You get new problems that you have to address. You build new tools to do that. So what do those new tools look like? How many of you know the story of, of Air France Flight 447? Went down to the Atlantic. It was um, one of the most tragic aviation accidents uh, you know, in, in history that I know. 2009, I think, was the actual date when this, when this happened. Uh, taking off from Rio, going to Paris. Airbus 330, marvel of engineering, right? This is a computer powerhouse. This had, you know, this, this thing can fly itself literally. Do you want to guess from Rio to Paris, how much time will the pilot spend at the wheel actually hand flying the plane? Rio to Paris, what do you think? Seven minutes. Seven minutes total. In ideal conditions. Some pilots like to fly, so they'll fly more. It's up to them, right? But in ideal conditions, it's seven minutes. This thing can take off. It can even land itself. Pilots like to say, we don't allow planes to do that. You know, we, li we like to be there. And well, yes, but it could. It could. A few hours out of Rio, 447 hits a thunderstorm. Not a big deal. Modern aircraft do that all the time. How many of you have been in a thunderstorm and hit by lightning in a plane? Well, it's not pleasant. It's kind of cool. It's a little scary. But, you know, you're all here to talk about it. Uh, and in the vast majority, overwhelming majority of cases, it is meaningless, right? Other than the fear factor, there's nothing going on that you should be worried about. Wasn't the case with 447 because when you're at those altitudes, icing is an issue. Again, modern aircraft have heating components and elements that heat up surface areas so that they don't accumulate ice. The pitot tube, however, is this very small opening that allows air to come in and the pressure of the air determines the airspeed of the aircraft. You cannot fly an aircraft without airspeed indicators. But two co-pilots, well-trained, well-equipped, one of them 37 years old, Pierre Cedric, takes the yoke and does the last thing that you want to do when you have no idea what your attitude is or what your airspeed is, which is he pulls back on the yoke, creating a, 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 a nose-up attitude of the plane, generating what's called a stall. A stall is when you, the Bernoulli principle no longer applies. I think that puts creates lift under your wings because the air pressure differential, it goes away. And the turbulence going over the wing creates a loss of lift and the plane literally falls out of the sky like a brick. It doesn't glide, it just falls. Now, you get that sense roller coaster sense in, in your stomach, but you still don't know what attitude you're at other than looking at your instruments. So you can adjust. For some reason, Pierre Cedric did not. For seven minutes, this is what they had to listen to in the cockpit. Stole, stole. Seven minutes of this, nonstop. This is the computer saying, I know we're in a stall. I know we're losing altitude. I get that. I'm going to make you aware of that because you have to take action to recover from the stall which is the easiest thing in the world. When you learn to fly, all you have to do, when I with a Cessna or, or an Airbus 380, you just push that yoke forward. You gain airspeed and the stall goes away. He didn't for seven minutes. What you just heard, that annoying sound, went on for seven full minutes. Not once in the transcripts, the black box recordings, not once did either co-pilot ever acknowledge the stall warning. How does that happen? Think about this for a minute. Why? in the world would you not even acknowledge the stall warning being given to you by the computer? Can someone answer that for me? 250 souls perished that day because of that. Why would you not acknowledge the stall warning? Tell me. I really want to know. They knew better than the machine. I'm a human being. This is a machine. How could this possibly outguess me? 
I've been trained to fly this thing. I take pride in flying this thing. I am a pilot, a human pilot with gray matter. Semiconductors aren't going to tell me what to do. How should have Pierre Cedric thought of the computer at that point? As opposed to a non-entity, can you offer me some kind of construct, mental construct, for how we should have thought of the computer? An ally, a collaborator, a co-pilot, for goodness sake. It's a machine, but collaborate with it. And it is this utter, and, and, and this is, look, if there's one point that I really hope you take away from this, it is that we look at AI and the machines not as collaborators. We barely look at them as tools, and we ignore them and what they have to tell us and teach us as a result. Simulation in the moment is how we should think of AI. AI can do in a, a million, you know, in one second a million times what it would take us hours to do. Right? That's what didn't happen in the 330. Now, now to, be, to be fair here, the 330 does not have AI flying it. It is rules-based flying. There's nothing about um, the computers on this plane that could have exhibited AI. But the point is we don't even, we don't even collaborate with the fundamental rules-based tools, much less those that are truly going to start exhibiting intelligent behavior. If you want to know more about this and this notion of collaboration, this gentleman, so Joseph, was, was, he was the person, the true father of the ARPANET. He wrote a wonderful memo in the 1960s called The Intergalactic Network, which he circulated within the defense community. That led to ARPANET. And his back, 1960, you know, back long before we were having this conversation when there were a few dozen mainframe computers, he said we need to look at these technologies as collaborators. It's taken us a while to get there, that 40 to 60 year period, but that's where we are right now. We are in that crisis of complexity where we're trying to figure out how do we create behaviors that can keep up with the machines. What is it that we can augment, not artificially create intelligence, but augment our intelligence with, through which, to deal with this complexity and the crises that are going to occur? And one of the answers to that is in the aviation battles over Korea during the Korean War, where there were two planes primarily involved, very equally matched, and, and the MiG and the F-86 were nearly identical in almost every single way, aerodynamically. In some ways, the MiG was actually better. It was a better plane, more maneuverable, higher ceiling, uh, uh, more armaments, uh, meaner, badder armaments, in fact. Uh, but what's interesting is that the F-86 actually won over the MiG-15. Do you want to guess why? The, it wasn't because of the airplanes. Why did the F-86 win over the MiG-15? What was it, do you think? The pilots were equally well trained. You can give a little bit of an edge to the pilots of the F-86 in terms of training, but it wasn't the training that they ultimately chalked it up to. But it was something that the pilots had. It wasn't the radar. It wasn't flight hours. It, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't the flight training. No, it wasn't, it wasn't the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the training that they, that they got. It wasn't simulation either. No, it wasn't the weapons guidance. It was the pressure suits. Because at that point in time, pressure suits were not widely used by jet pilots, so what you would end up with, the pilots that could fly jets were just physiologically made in such a way that when the blood drained from their brain, they wouldn't pass out. Not a good thing to do when you're flying a, a jet in a dogfight, right? Um, the pressure suits gave them an edge, because with the pressure suit, think about this, what they could do was focus on the mission objective. Because when you're pulling eight or nine Gs and you're trying to squeeze your butt cheeks so that all the blood goes to your brain, you ain't thinking of much else. You're just trying to stay conscious. When you got a pressure suit on, you can focus on the task. Isn't that kind of where we are right now? Right? The, technology, the technology has so exceeded our ability that we're fearful of it. You know, we can't maintain consciousness or, or clarity of thought because of it until it becomes a collaborator and we use it as a device through which we augment our capabilities. So will this put people out of work? Absolutely. AI will definitely put people out of work. There's no doubt. It'll kill entry-level positions. I mean, the whole way that you and I got into, you know, out of school getting entry-level, that is going to be decimated. But will it create an ability to apply human capital, ingenuity, brilliance, curiosity to bigger problems? Because the problems we have are much bigger going forward than they have been looking back? Absolutely. So I'm not saying this is without disruption. I know it is. I mean, we're not asking for it. No one wakes up in the morning saying, you know what? Christ, I just really want to be disrupted today. 
throw it at me. Right? No one wakes up and says, as a society, we want, we want to be disrupted. We want people to be put out of work. But we do this and we adapt and we end up in a place that we look back from and say, how did we ever survive without this?